Thank you so much. Uh, and you're absolutely right. We have a great uh, we have a great panel. I think what's great about the panel is that it's divided into the segments that we usually interact with, right? There are brand custodians, uh, there are obviously agency and technology partners, and there are the content creators themselves. I can't call them influencers anymore. They don't like it. Uh, but we're going to try and bridge the conversation that the entire industry is having, uh, which is about where influencer marketing is today, where we see influencer marketing fitting into the entire marketing mix. Uh, and most importantly, what they see the role of this entire industry moving forward. I think there's a lot in that conversation itself. But what I'm going to try and do with each one of you is going to try and go a lot deeper than just having surface level conversations about this. Uh, so the first question, which is what I will throw open the forum with, is where do you think this industry is right now in context to where it was? And therefore, what is the role it's going to play in the marketing mix? And every one of you will have your own point of view for it. Like, what do the brands think about it? What do us agency folk think about it? And most importantly, how do you view the industry as content creators yourself? So anybody, I can start with any lady first. Uh, Rasika, why don't you take it? So, hello. It's good. It's good. <laughs> hello. Yeah. So I think from a brand point of view, um, how we look at it is like whether it's influencer marketing or whether it's celebrity marketing, all of these are basically vehicles which uh, ride the wave for the consumer at that point in time, which helps you take your, or your brand to that consumer and becomes a relevant medium. What we have seen with any of these trends which comes on digital, unlike ATL advertising or you know print or outdoors, which are traditional media like we call it, uh, they have a low uh, shelf life because this consumer has been spoiled for choice, especially when they are consuming content on the digital space. There is a lot of ad fatigue, there is a lot of want for more, there's a lot of like attention issues. Hence, um, and I'm not too sure if the, it's the right thing, today like I just presented my entire AOP budget for, the, for next year and uh, what we feel is while it used to be a wow factor in the past, Today, because the consumer understands the nuances of it, they know that this is sponsored. They know that an influencer is putting it out there. And also because, uh, partly probably because the way the influencers have handled it. Uh, I think it is a beautiful medium, but when there is no, uh, there's no non-compete or you're trying to do, there's no strategy. That it was just like, you know, a lot of brands being promoted by an influencer, all that whole piece. Uh, and also that it's lived the time of its day. Like for example, if a brand has a celebrity endorsing it, like one, and it's purely on digital and it's not on TV, then you know that that content costed you a lot of money, but the ROI on it didn't really like play up. So I feel while it's one of the levers in the marketing mix, the fad that it had like two years ago is not there anymore. I'm, I'm gonna try and avoid uh the, the point where when it comes to the men, they probably say everything that you guys have said. So I'm going to interject and try and, and make this a lot more conversational. And I think Pallavi, yeah. this is the right step in for what you're doing, right? Because the conversation is about short term engagements with long term engagements and, yes. and in the kind of business that you're doing uh, in, your, in your agency. I think it's opportune for you to talk about how you are seeing this differently from a long term point of view. Uh, and it's a lot to do with us agencies and brands as well that having the long-term conversations and convincing the content creator to look at a brand association in a long-term point of view is still something that's amiss, yeah. right? Like, we like the, the lists that go over 100, 100 lines in an Excel sheet, and we, we struggle to have the conversations with shorter lines. So since that's what you do, please. So, I mean, I'll, I'm just clarifying because I don't do hats. I run uh, the chief strategy officer piece at HRX and I run my own agency as well where I deal with influencers and celebrities for a long-term engagement with businesses. Now, while I understand what Rasika is talking about is the pertinent problem that our, every marketer is kind of today faced with, but having said that, that the industry that I come from, which is fitness predominantly, 
um, influencer marketing piece has gone on to becoming a very important sort of a part of the entire jigsaw. And I will, I, I, I'll try uh, logically deducing why. It is dealt with by us, both at a strategic level as well as tactical level. But what I think has helped us in understanding is defining the purpose of this influencer marketing, right? Now, fitness, you have to understand, or any other industry today, um, you cannot base your communication to the consumer on the product or the product offering beyond a certain limit. There's a threshold to content, to consumption, to, to sort of creativity. But the moment you go into defining your purpose, which is, in our case, in the case of the fitness industry, is probably giving out the clarion call and getting more and more people to join the fitness wagon. The moment you start defining the purpose of your influencer marketing as something which is going to create a cult, which is going to help you create a cohort, which is going to help you bring together a community, it just becomes more long-lived, it becomes more strategic. And of course, there's the tactical part of it as well, where we need to sell the products, we need to unbox it, we, we, need, to create, we need to creatively dole out the product to the consumer so that it starts cutting the clutter and the customer can choose it, it goes and sits in the consideration set, or how um, through tactical influencer marketing, how Bonvita can change its sugar content on the packaging. I mean, all of, that is, all of that is a very, very tactical piece, I feel. But having said that, influencer marketing today particularly needs to be dealt with on a long-term basis where the purpose is identified, where the vision is charted out, where the purpose is defined for everyone to follow. Till that is done, it will always be difficult to identify the right influencer, the right name, who to go with, how much to spend, what is the return I'm garnering on this. But the moment, I guess, we, we, we give ourselves a kind of clarity saying, we're doing this to achieve that. It's about creating a movement. It's about initiating more people into a certain kind of cohort. I guess the task gets simplified. And it just goes on to becoming a very, very befitting part of the overall strategy. And I'm going to, you know, go back to Sai and Prableen on this, right? Like, we have two marketeers sitting over here uh, who are basically saying, we want longevity, we want the ability to utilize the community that you have built into, uh, into having access to the kind of products that, that, that everybody is building. But a large part of the narrative that is being presented to brands like these is that that's not a conversation that most of you are willing to have. Right, um, and width is far more important than depth is. Right, so either either it's the truth and 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 there is a reason for it, or it's the direction that you'd like to venture towards, and not enough is coming towards you, which automatically will probably identify a gap in a direction in which we can go taking this industry. So over to you guys, and and you guys are not new to this, so it's not like I'm asking a premature question, uh, but since you guys have been around have the right kind of metrics, uh, I think it'll be great to hear from you. So, um, hi guys, I'm Rivlin. So, I basically started off like five years ago, five, five and a half years ago. So, I feel that when I started off, I, uh, like my audience grew because I spoke a lot about being no filter. That was my hashtag. Uh, because I had so much acne, I had acne on my face, my back, my hands, and it was so um, embarrassing. and it just made me so insecure and uh, I didn't have the confidence to step out of the house. And back then, I had brands, like big brands, um, that would come up to me and reject my content pieces and ask me to blur out my acne, only then will you get the approval. Cut to five years later, I am seeing brands doing the no filter campaign. So I feel the mindset itself has changed so much. And um, that has a lot to do with creators talking so much about it. So uh, I do agree with her that the ROI could not be as much as maybe it would be on a TVC. But I still feel that the awareness that the creators bring about, especially for the youth, uh, plays a very big role, is what I personally have heard from the brands as well when we have those conversations. And um, also when I think about um, the conversations that happens um, from the creator to the brand, there's a lot um, that happens in the media, like in the middle, there's just so many layers to it, uh, which is why so many times what we're actually 
wanting to do or we're wanting to um, execute does not reach the brand itself because there are so many mediums in the middle. So I feel that's also something that we tackle a lot as creators and that is something that is not as challenging when it comes to newer homegrown startups and um, new uh, brands that are open to having those discussions, that are open to giving you the creative freedom. Um, like recently I did this brand collaboration with a homegrown brand and um, I'm not comparing with any other brand, but um, the entire concept from the scripting to the editing to everything, the shooting, everything was done by me. And it was a branded video, but it's, it's because the audience understood how it worked for me. The video crossed more than four, four and a half million views. And it was branded and yet it did so well. That was because the entire creative freedom was given to me. So I feel there is just a lot of aspects that are that play a, a very big role, but yeah, it has to be like an amalgamation of everything. Basically, it comes down to you and I, Kalyan. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> just side, please. Yeah. Uh, she said it. She said it perfectly. Uh, the thing about creative freedom is why we ask for it is because we have sort of we sort of now know our audience well and how they want branded content to be presented to them. If it just like starts with like the brand and the close-ups and, and all of that. They're just like, oh, it's another ad and they scroll, like we skip on YouTube. So uh, creative freedom is basically us trying to also help the brand saying, I know if I do this in this way and if I make it fun and if I add this music, if I, these lyrics, because uh, I do it through music and uh, jingles and uh, ads. I, I try to sort of add value to the brand by by myself writing something for them or uh, uh, making like a theme for them or like an anthem or something. And uh, brands have genuinely been kind to me because they understood uh, that the creative freedom should have been given. Be it any brand, be it like a hair extensions brand or like a makeup brand, whichever. And uh, that's the thing. Uh, understanding your audience is better and then asking for creative freedom and that ge all gelling together, the amalgamation really helps. And she does it exceptionally well. Like she does it so well. Yeah, I mean, uh, just to just to give you context, that we run agencies and we face this issue with brands every day. Make the logo bigger, put it over there. It's it's reduced a little, so hopefully it'll it'll transfer onto the influencer space as well. So it's not a it's not a it's not a lonely fight. I promise you, it's a fight that all of us are fighting at every given point in time. I'm gonna just remove my chair hat and put my agency hat on for this one. So thanks for that. But you guys, right? Like, I mean, read up about you. We we spoke a little. Y'all are looking at it from a proper dhanda and ROI point of view, right? Like that, those are the numbers. That's what it's being. That's what it's being reported. It's one part of it is what everyone is talking about: brand building, top of funnel. You know, we're able to use the top of funnel, create consideration. But what is what is this category as a part of your media mix, right? Because you're also you also belong to a category where the content creator influencer media mix is is directly attributable to the kind of numbers that you're doing, right? So having heard the brand building side of it, I want to understand the dhanda side of it and, and understand how important it is in that, in that context. I think I relate to what both Sai and Prabhleen are saying, and we have been guilty of that in the early days. Let me also add in the early days. So we have tried to control the narrative to the extent that it actually starts looking an ad, like an ad and it doesn't work. So now we have warmed up to the idea that we need to work with the creators to kind of come up with content which is as genuine as possible. Uh, while there will be some brand plugs, obviously, uh, logo will be there, product shot has to be there. But the more natural and organic we have made it, the better response we have seen. So the dhanda actually works better if we are able to uh, listen and work with both the creators and the agencies uh, to kind of figure out how to make this work because all the parties involved actually want to make this work. So trying to control the narrative too much has stopped working more and more. In the early days, if it was working to an next level, now it has completely stopped working. Uh, in fact, we are probably one of the few beauty brands which has partnered with a lot of comics to just get our name out, right? So the ROI and the metrics we are talking about, Pratik, you know, at different stages, those metrics will change. And with content creators measuring sales or aaj char creators kya, kal kitna business bada, we don't look at it that way at all. 
we do do look at you know reach metrics engagement metrics what are the kind of contents uh, comments which are coming in is the comment saying you know why are you saying this product good or did you try it long enough or this worked for me what do you think about this ingredient or is the comment didi aap achhi lag rahi ho right so if it's the didi aap achhi lag rahi ho that audience is clearly not resonating with you or the content which has been put out which then either is a problem of the wrong content creator selection or wrong messaging or something else so we have to figure it out so that the content has to resonate and we have seen it resonate with across categories obviously if it's a very category specific content creator you know sahil and we are both in the beauty space so there are content creators which are heavily into beauty makeup there the messaging is slightly easier but if it's a lifestyle influencer uh, if it's a comic we have worked with the messaging has to be according to the audience of the creator and not what the brand wants to do uh, we were also talking about you know what stage you know i think uh, of uh, rasika was mentioning about you know where the roi is so our belief is slightly different there that in the 0 to 1 and 1 to 10 journey uh, it it plays a more deeper role because the brand is not known at all and the awareness and the trust building has to happen through uh, a lot more investments on the content creator side as you go on the 10 to 100 journey the role changes so now earlier we were always on almost like you know the old media planning days of always on you know you will do like six campaigns with sustenance and all of that Uh, now we are a little more engagement driven so when we are launching a new product we want reviews out uh, and you know and we have had uh, you know content creators sometimes not speak very very good things about the products and we are okay because that's the genuine feedback uh, so we have to look at the stage of the brand and you know where the evolution of the brand is to identify what the needs of the brand is what is the communication which has to go out and then accordingly you know draw out an influencer plan obviously that pyramid of you know cat a cat b cat c the jargon which the industry uses i think there is a role which is there so we also work with for example dermats so there the reach may not be very high but it can be very heavy on education because that's the kind of audience they have it can talk about one ingredient in great depth application how long do you leave it all of that versus if you're working with a lifestyle influencer the messaging has to be little more gentle versus if you're working with a stand up comic it has to be put in a very humorous context and not go heavy on education absolutely so i'll i'll and summarize that, afterwards i yeah, promise i know because i think i've um, i live in a different bubble probably <laughs> because uh, i think uh, for us at um, you know at swiss beauty maybe because it's also the category is such that it you know it's 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 makeup and i think it's um, i feel it's a little unfair to think that an influencer or a creator should you know tie themselves down to any one brand uh, because as a con- if if i am looking at a creator the reason i'm following the creator is because even i want to discover new and new things so if you're going to come back and keep talking to me about the same brand or the same category um, i kind of lose interest in you um, i want to look at new things fresher things and want to keep discovering um so i think it's important maybe again because it's makeup it's a very large basket size right i mean it's possible you could be using 15 brands on your face at any given point of time and that's fine right because i can't expect you to have such a large basket size from a single brand so i think it just probably from my category it gives me a lot of you know space and scope um and so i think from a discovery perspective i think creators are extremely important and has been extremely important you know for um for our brand um other than that i think i've just probably been fortunate that uh, creators have driven a lot of business um you know for 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 me um and for my brand and it's also been because you know like probably and, and sai said i think maybe because we just give them a lot of creative liberty uh, there are no briefs that ro- that you know we at this beauty roll out at all they are zero briefs this is the product do what you want to do with it and uh, they have been more and more instances i mean the most recent one being just in this month um, you know the holographic eyeliner it just took off and you know probably would know about it it just took off it was on google trends it came as a breakout word we did nothing it was only and only my creators that did everything for that brand you know for the for the product similarly 3 4 months ago we had a lipstick and i mean just a bunch of creator creators sold 15000 lipsticks 15000 lipsticks direct sales from creators so i mean i think probably i'm just been either i've just been fortunate or probably uh, you know it's just probably a different world i'm living in but um, from from for me i think creators and my retailers are probably the two biggest voices uh, you know for the brand to you know reach where we where we have reached so far i was at a i was at a launch event yesterday uh, for one beauty brand that we work with large fmcg since you're well media trained i won't i won't take brand names too uh, but 
the insight for the category is very similar, right? In the space that you guys are operating, beauty, lifestyle, right? The content creators play a significantly very, very important role in what happens. And the utility of the, of the, of the creator, of the influencer, starts to appreciate or depreciate given the kind of categories that you're going in, right? And, and that, for me, sitting over here, just having four diverse points of views from brand custodians is evident. Right, like and how Pratik product is win. I mean, I think that's that just his default. I think if the creator is genuinely happy, I and mean, that's something which I have noticed, when they are genuinely happy with the quality of the product, you will be surprised there'll be some free plugin coming in in the next some video of theirs because they genuinely are a user it's and not the, just the creator for it's the, the product. It's the last slide of all my decks. So it basically says I can make you go that far. If your product is shit, no one can do anything. Right, like because the great publicity will also bring you back the, the same brickbats. I think Kalyan, now it's, uh, it's you and I, boss, we're in the middle of this. Uh, <laughs> how do we bridge this conversation? Uh, audible? Yeah. I think a lot of this conversation can be bridged. Uh, what's, so you asked what's emerging is, I think there's a lot of maturity coming into this influencer marketing world. A lot of marketeers, because that's where the money comes from, uh, have the proverbial question of the earlier marketing world, which is 50% of my money goes down the drain and I don't know which 50% it is. And how do you answer that? So he's saying that, look, also the, the, well, the global numbers are at some 22, 24 billion dollars in the creator economy, and India has pegged at about 15 to 1700 crores uh, and growing to maybe 2500 crores in two years. Uh, what the question right now, and this is going to sound a little bit of a shocker, that almost 400 crores of that, in my estimation, is going down the drain in the creator economy. And that's massive. And to your question, that you know, I don't know what's happening, and I'm bummed out of it. Uh, problem number one a statistical analysis of a huge number of influences, almost 8 million in India shows that 60% of influencers or creators have fake or inactive followers. That is not a 15% problem. That's a 50 to 60% problem. Which means, statistically, if I'm doing a 100 influencer campaign, if you adjust for efficacy of audiences, 30% straight off the bat, and randomly picked is going down the drain uh, because there are no real audiences. The second optimization, and this is again be fun, if you're a beauty-led brand, out of, let's say, uh, uh, analysis of 1.45 million female profiles on Instagram in India, you'll be surprised to know that only 6% have at least 50% female audiences which means all the big beauty brands and things are speaking to guys now. So for all these hygiene level considerations, all our marketing has been about, uh, I have a piece of, I have something to say and I define my audiences. For influencers, the time is now matured and everyone's asking that, look, I love you as an influencer content creator, but I need to see the relevance of your audiences. What are their proximities? What do they like? Are they interested in shopping for beauty or not? Can we answer those questions? So a lot of that kind of discussion is uh, now happening. The other bit, again, emerging trend, and obviously lots of white papers on this, the, the fascination with big influences is where it's going down because they cost a lot of money, one shot. Their engagement rates are normally much lower than a mid-sized influencer, a macro or a micro. So now you want to find influences from Guwahati to Meerut to Arnakulam who are relevant to your audiences. And, and, and then you say, do they have female audiences? Can we answer such questions? Uh, so that's, that's where we feel that, you know, move to micro-influences, move to performance. Now, I would say that, and I agree with you guys, you cannot make an ad out of your influencer's content. Brand first. It's like make my logo larger. You see, which is what we're coming to a later topic, which is storytelling. And there are literally behavioral science techniques to saying that, how do I convince someone? I could crack a lot of jokes around this with my boiled head, saying, hey, I met this bald guy, 
but you know, he talks some very interesting stuff versus saying, hey, this is, uh, you know, X, Y, Z. So how do you build story first? Then you weave your narrative, other structured methods using nudge theories of behavioral science to construct a communication that will convince people. And also it's been very manual. So how much machines are coming in to say, look, how do I find these other influencers who, uh, you know, are not the usual suspects, which is literally in every country, and we've seen this in Middle East, India, and Indonesia at least, the top 2,000 influencers in every country do most of the campaigns. And where's the long tail? Where's the discovery? Why should an influencer with 2 million followers, but 80% fake, win the battle against a hardworking content creator influencer who has 1 million followers, but all of it legit? So lots of questions here, but these trends of saying data-led, what is the science data? What is the art? Listen to the influencer, respect their audience and learning of how they create content. And then we saying that, and cut your influencer marketing budgets by half, you'll still do 2x the numbers that you did last year. It's possible. We have data to prove. And a lot of people have that data and we've studied that. So those are the trends where I think the marketeers are asking good questions. Content creators are understanding their audiences, and the marriage of these two aspects can really change. I'm saying, you know, that's that's my take on the emerging trends. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I know I'm gonna suppose to chair this, but I'm gonna rebut this a little bit, uh, and just some parts which I, which I, which I don't, which I don't agree. And and if you ask, if you ask me the framing of my question, right, uh, not not to you, but to the larger audience. The framing of my question was, do you look at influencers as a category, or do you look at influencers as a part of your media mix? And I keep coming to the media mix conversation. The reason I keep coming to the media mix conversation is primarily the influencer industry, as they're calling it, are made up of brands who want to use influencer marketing to, you know, to reach out to a community of people through usually agencies that they're that they contracting. The problem is that each one of us is answering a singular question. Right? All creatives, I'm saying, let's forget influencers for two minutes, but any creative I make cannot solve the same problem through the fun. Any influencer, therefore, cannot solve the same problem through the fun. We forget the value of media associated with this influencer. And I say this with, with, with past experiences of how we made TV advertising, right? Even if I took an Alia Bhatt, who, if you go back and check, will have 80% male following, and yeah, why not, right? Uh, even if you go to Alia Bhatt, you would still choose women-dominated television channels to run those ads in. So as important as the creator or, in, or celebrity or whatever you were to categorize them as, was the medium and the media was as, as crucial. If influencers actually become a part of solving the funnel problem and they become a part of solving a business outcome and you look at it as a medium that can travel, sometimes organically and sometimes through a push, yeah. you're going to be able to solve a lot more problems than what we are trying to unilaterally solve today. And that personally is my biggest issue with, with the way conversations around influencers is happening. Totally in agreement and just want to add to that. So you didn't kind of rebut, but you know, I'm saying, uh, first of all, the, I'm, what we're seeing with brands is like, are you looking for a um, brand ambassador or are you looking for a brand advocate? Correct. And that is a very different answer the moment you say, look, literally for Alia Bhatt, I need one Alia Bhatt for my campaign then. Yeah. So she becomes a brand ambassador and I put media behind it and I get audiences. But my influences don't need to be in, Aliabats. Even if I add media and get them to reach, maybe somebody has 30% female audiences, but my media can take that to 5x female audiences. Uh, but we are saying the influencer part of the advocacy is, uh, instead of it coming as a sponsored ad on my timeline, how about first the conversation is as organic, and then you, so we, all, this has to be passed. Role of media, size of the influencers versus uh, what they could be doing. A big influencer is a visibility driver, the smaller influencers are credibility drivers all the way down to people like me who are truly, truly advocates towards engagement or even purchase decisions. You know, it's, it's like the fun story. It's like the bigger I am, 
which you just kind of said, the bigger I am, the less likely my followers are going to think that I'm saying something beautiful about a brand out of the goodness of my heart. So how do you design for that? So many, many layers. How old a brand are you? Are you a new brand or you are a legacy brand that, that doesn't need the visibility? You just need the advocacy. And is it cool that you're driving or it's a high purchase product? So rational, emotional. So yeah, lots of less, but I'm just adding to what you're saying. You're absolutely yeah. right. Sorry, Pallavi was saying something. I think um, while both of you were discussing the brand ambassador and the brand advocate part of it, the way we have solved for it, and this term pretty much exists and a lot of people have adopted it, we have created brand evangelists. I mean, that's the term which is fluidly being kind of, um, you know, brushed into the businesses and strategies. And for once, just putting the metrics aside, I mean, of course, engagement matters, reach, broad reach matters, uh, the content affinity matters. I think the criteria for us has filtered down to who is that person with whom your story most organically befits so that it looks effortless. And that content, in, in the layman terms, has performed the best for us. I, and I guess that's true of all the categories, that's true of all creators. When there is a seamless organic fit with the product, with the ideology, and with the creator and the creativity, I guess there is virality. Um, so that's what I wanted to say. I mean, it's, it's like multiple brand evangelists who are adopting your product, who are advocating it, who are living it and using it, and therefore kind of propagating the word across. So there is no direct marketing kind of a scenario here, a live shopping kind of a scenario, but it's kind of building on the advocacy piece. I was actually looking around because I was told to stop a long time ago. Uh, it's also not helpful that such a good conversation, unfortunately, we can only do one round through it. Uh, but do I have time? Do I need to stop? I need to stop. It's on her face. Uh, I get it. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, is uh, sorry, I, I really was enjoying this conversation. We were discussing not, not otherwise. Uh, but most importantly, just not your last thoughts. I think all of us have a very different role to play in this ecosystem coming together. I think all of us must have learnt a new perspective. Uh, just one learning and one addition to our perspective that we can probably take away from this conversation would be great. And I'll start with the gentleman, so please. So I'll just highlight one new trend we are learning about. Vernacular content is doing great. And uh, so the lowest engagement we see is on English content. English works better, but Vernac works even better. Yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm anyways a very pro-creator community for me. Everything is working well. I have no complaints at all. But yeah, I think I'm, we are also kind of double-clicking on the fact that, you know, as, as English as it gets probably for us, we are seeing a, we are seeing a huge uptick on that. Thanks. I guess what I, where I've tasted success is um, inclusivity, where you kind of talk to everybody. You talk a uniform language through different shape, sizes, varieties, all being, you know, cat, kind of uh, equally treated. And um, along with that, what's also really working well for us is uh, long-term relationships, not just a one-off, uh, which looks like a touch and go, but something that you build on, uh, and I don't mean the teaser, pre-buzz, launch and the post-launch kind of a way, but a more meaningful sort of a relationship where the person then features in your campaigns as well. You're also seeing them at your events. There's a broader level relationship brewing with the community members. Uh, I really like this word, uh, smooth integration. Two words, sorry. Smooth integration. And uh, it basically means what so the things that your audiences like to see on your page, you add an element of that, and then you make the brand, uh, the product or the brand uh, interesting in that space, and that is really enjoyable for the audience. Like the initially, I'll just make it very quick. Initially, it used to be like the first five seconds, the brands would want the name to be taken. And uh, when I suggested to uh, this brand that is, mainly in music, and even I do music. So I said, could I take your name at the end? It's, it was a one minute video, and I said it at the end, and all my audiences were like, oh, this is an ad, cool, now we'll check it out. And after that started working, every band has told me to put their, uh, do the integration at the end, 
and that's how smooth it has become. So I love that brands are trusting the vision now and smooth integration is the name of the game. Media agencies will not be happy with what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> because they'll come to all of our offices and say the exact opposite. <laughs> Sorry, please. I think what works the best for my audience and for me is um, because I'm, I, I talk a lot about being real and raw and no filter on my page. I feel that just um, whenever it's actually in sync with the brand and if I feel that the brand is understanding the tonality of my page, um, only then we move ahead with the conversation. Um, but I think brands now, like I've seen this change uh, with brands since the last six months, that they're actually open to agreeing to what you have to, you know, give them. Because before it was just like one single brief was given to 50 creators, which did not work as they said. But I think that took a long time for brands to understand that. But now that it, they've understood that, oh, we're not getting returns in this and it's not giving us exact reach, I feel that is a very um, good change that I'm seeing right now is that they're open to what you think is best for your audience and then we'll take the you know story ahead. So, so I think, um, I mean, you know, I used to work in an agency for the first eight years of my career and then when I moved to the brand side, uh, I realized one thing that a lot of times uh, marketeers or brand managers are you know, 70 to 80 percent of their job is not to do marketing. 70 to 80 percent of their job is to create products, is to sell, is to create demand in the market. It's only 30 percent of their time they should optimally use to do marketing, which means they are not subject matter, matter experts. They have the money in order to deploy into those media mixes. And hence, if agencies, partners, media solution guys, give them an entire package for them to be able to understand understand what is their want, what really are they looking for and to be able to clear that package where say that this is the content, this is how relevant it is for you, this is the result that you'll get and this is where your brand will get impacted. Trust me, they will buy into it a lot more and they will stick to it because they are seeking partners more than uh, how frivolously we take them and at the end of the day, the marketing money is live with them. And like Anurag clearly said, right, I mean, we are a brand which are we've crossed the 0 to 10 stage. So for us, regional marketing makes a lot of difference. Now you cannot do that with HSM. So you want this kind of customized contextual marketing. And what I would request is the trust on pure social media platforms is dwindling for all of us as marketers because we're like the time and money and the time it takes, we don't have that kind of time. We're like, we cannot be like, like, like you said, right, a marketer doesn't have the time to look at every influencer's content, talk to every them. Like, our job is to make sure we get the targets in for the month. So if you could look at it as a more 360 platform of how an influencer could, you know, go the whole gamut and not just stick to social media, I think it will be a lot more of a long-term solve, and that's what marketers are seeking. When you're the last to speak, it's pretty much all points covered. So... I, I, just, I tried to avoid it. I swear I did. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, no, it works for me. But so, so the summary is, I think, uh, what you guys just said. Uh, let's go from. Is this a global trend? Let's go from the influencer marketing of India to the influencer marketing of Bharat, which is hit every region. Find the vernacs. Find the little people. Like the growing people. Uh, the other biggest story is involve. The art and science is what is being coming out. Okay, look, what kind of content with what kind of freedom should an influencer make? And what is the data consideration that you should have to decide and make those decisions on who will come on the table? I think and this therefore cannot be a campaign-led thing, in fact, and always on influencer marketing should be about advocacy, in my opinion, and therefore that should that's something you build on the side. It's like a your infantry and your army versus the air force being your TV and ADL and out of home and whatever. So yeah, uh, bits of everything. Um, thank you. Thank you, guys. I'm just going to two lines summarize what I have taken away. Uh, probably in, as opposed to how you think, this is still a very young industry. Uh, a lot of the problems you quoted, advertising has not solved in 40 years. So the fact that they've made this much progress in the last five, we've, we've, moved, we've moved quite a few steps. Uh, and 
that's where that's the intersection that we're actually at right everybody understands that this is an important part of the marketing mix that they have each brand has a different problem to solve presently and majorly the solutions to all of those problems are being dealt with unilaterally but the problem needs to be looked at differently different aspects of advertising marketing and thinking need to be added back to the you know to the mix and this evolution will continue for a while and i think we just all have to continue to play our roles in enabling this bridge that 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 marries the creators to the brands and and move forward from there thank you so much for your great insights guys thank you